Hello, everyone. I think we should probably get started here since uh, time on my computer says 7.01 p.m. Uh, my name is Natasha Mystery, and I am the Manager of Public Policy and Stakeholder Relations with Crohn's and Colitis Canada. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity today to moderate today's webinar and to learn more from our guest speakers, Dr. Eric Benchimol and Emily Heffernan. I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to the webinar. Thank you both. Today's education webinar, Getting Through It, Choosing Your Path to Good Health, is hosted by Crohn's and Colitis Canada. It's made possible through an educational grant from ABV and is part of the ABV IBD scholarship program. Before we start the presentation, some of you may be new to the webinar, so I'll quickly run through how you can ask questions and how they will be answered. Right now, all of the participants are automatically muted so that everyone can hear the speakers and so we can capture this webinar recording without audio interference. If you would like to ask a question at any point during the webinar, simply look on the right side for a field on your screen called Questions. You can ask questions to the speakers by typing this into the chat box. When you ask a question, even if the speaker is still talking, we will make note of your question and will present the questions when speakers have finished their presentation. So please feel free to type out your questions as you have them, and I will read as many as we have time for during the Q&A portion of our webinar, after both of our speakers have presented. If we don't manage to get to your question because we ran out of time, please feel free to follow up with us at the end. Um, you can email it at info at ibdscholarship.ca. We'll also have that email for you at the end of the slide presentation. If you experience a technical, uh, if you have a technical question, you can also type this into the box and we'll follow up with you directly. If you have trouble hearing the speakers, um, you can also, it, you know, it might be probably due to your computer's audio settings. Try calling into the phone number provided using a mobile or landline phone. Great. We're, get, we're ready to get started now. So just a little bit about Crohn's and Colitis Canada. For those just joining, again, my name is Natasha Mystery. Manager of Public Policy and Stakeholder Relations at Crohn's and Colitis Canada's National Office. Crohn's and Colitis Canada was established in 1974 by a group of concerned parents of children with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We are a national charity dedicated to finding treatments and cures for Crohn's and colitis and to educate people with these diseases and the public. We want the general public to be aware of these chronic diseases and the toll it takes on the nearly quarter of a million Canadians living with Crohn's and colitis. We also want people living with these diseases to be as well resourced as possible to live well and manage their disease. Crohn's and Colitis Canada has funded over $88 million in research to date. That makes us one of the largest funders of Crohn's and colitis research in the world. We have more than 65,000 supporters, many of whom are actively involved in our 80 volunteer groups or chapters across Canada, and many of whom who have joined us today. Today's webinar is part of Crohn's and Colitis Canada's Youth Engagement and Education Program. This includes the ABV IBD Scholarship Program, Camp Got to Go for Children and Teens with Crohn's and Colitis, and this, our second annual youth-focused webinar series. Our education materials cover a variety of medical, social, and psychological issues related to Crohn's and Colitis. We have brochures covering issues specific to children with Crohn's and Colitis, ostomy care, medication, and many other topics. I will leave it at that for now, but if you would like more information about Crohn's and Colitis Canada, please visit our website at 
Crohn's and Colitis One Word dot CA. I'm pleased now to introduce you to our guest speakers, Dr. Eric Benchimal and Emily Heffernan. Dr. Benchimal is currently a clinician scientist at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, CHEO for short, IBD Center. Scientist at CHEO Research Institute and the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences and Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Epi Epidemiology at the University of Ottawa. He studies the epidemiology and outcomes of patients with IBD and examines health systems issues for patients with chronic diseases using health administrative data. He also has an interest in the methods used to conduct and report research using health administrative data. Sorry, I just repeated myself. <laughs> His clinical practice is focused on children and adolescents with IBD. Emily Heffernan is a student at Queen's University and a past winner of AbbVie Ab Ab IBD Scholarship. She will be entering her third year of electrical engineering in the fall. Outside of class, Emily is the co-chair of Queen's Crohn's and Colitis Community Committee and the president of RoboGals Queen's, a student organization that introduces young girls to the possibilities of engineering. Emily was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in August of 2013, two weeks before she moved away to school. Learning to manage her condition while adapting to university life was challenging, but she was able to find some strategies that worked for her. Emily manages her symptoms with a combination of medication, diet, exercise, and yoga. So I will now hand over the presentation to Dr. Eric Benchimal and Emily Heffernan to talk to you about tonight's topic. Thank you, Natasha, and thank you everyone for attending. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to you today. We'll have a short presentation. We hope not to take up in the majority of the time and leave plenty of time at the end of the uh, presentation for questions and concerns, anything you might have to ask uh, that we can address on the on the uh, the webinar, but in addition, we can be reached at. Uh, you can see the the email address for Emily above and my Twitter account. Uh, you're welcome to ask any questions. I can't provide any health information online, but if you want to ask uh, indirect questions about coping with IBD, I'm happy to answer via Twitter. So, firstly, an introduction to us both. Uh, Natasha obviously gave a nice introduction before, but a in little more informal introduction. So I am a, I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, so a physician at the CHEO IBD Center here in Ottawa, which means I treat uh, children and adolescents right up to the age of 18 with inflammatory bowel disease. I'm also an assistant professor of pediatrics and epidemiology at University of Ottawa and a health systems health services researcher. So my interest is really uh, finding out how the healthcare system treats patients, both children and adults with IBD, uh, and how we can do better in terms of treating these patients, giving them better access to care and uh, better knowledge about their disease and better care overall in terms of quality of care. And I may also have been chosen for this webinar because I was, until recently, <laughs> a fairly long-term university student. I attended uh, York University, Western, uh, University of Ottawa, and University of Toronto, all over Ontario between 1993 and 2010. So I'm pretty well versed in navigating the university system and dealing with all the bureaucracy that it entails. Although I don't have a chronic disease, I, I know a little bit about the, you know, the administration and how to navigate that system. And I'll pass it on to Emily. Hi everyone, this is Emily. Um, thanks for the introduction, Natasha. So as she mentioned, I'm just entering my third year of electrical engineering at Queen's University. And if all goes well, I'm hoping to graduate in 2017. I was honored to receive the AbV scholarship back in 2014. And I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in August of 2013, just two weeks before I was set to move away to school. So I'd just like to start by talking to you a bit more about my experience with Crohn's disease. I'm sure that lots of our listeners will be able to relate to what I went through, and I'd like to share that with you. So I started having symptoms of Crohn's disease back when I was in high school. My symptoms were pretty typical of IBD. I was experiencing an upset stomach, bloody diarrhea, and static stomach pain. I blamed my symptoms on stress, though, and I ignored them as they steadily progressed. The summer I finished grade 12, my health began to deteriorate pretty rapidly. My upset stomach was getting increasingly worse, and I was losing a lot of weight. 
I was eventually driven to the emergency department with a case of thrombosed hemorrhoids, which I'd been too embarrassed to address until the pain became unbearable. While I was at the hospital, the doctor discovered a soft lump in my lower right abdomen, and I was sent for some tests and eventually referred to a gastroenterologist. Two weeks before I was scheduled to move to university, I received a colonoscopy and I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. The following four months were the hardest I've faced in my life. I spent my first semester fighting continuous flare-ups and I came very close to dropping out of school altogether. However, in December I was finally able to find a treatment plan that worked for me and since then I've become much better at managing my condition while I'm at school. Coming to terms with a chronic illness and adjusting to university life are both huge challenges on their own and doing both of them at the same time is very daunting. But today I'm hoping to share some of the challenges that I've faced during my first and second year. And more importantly, I want to share with you some methods that I've developed to cope with and overcome these challenges. Great, thanks Emily. So we were asked to talk today about uh, the transition uh, and living with uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis when you're an adolescent and a young adult and managing that transition uh, from the pediatric healthcare system to the adult healthcare system and also the transition from living at home and going to high school to going out and getting your first job or going to post-secondary education such as university and college. And so to do that, I wanted to start a little bit in, in defining what the transition from pediatric to adult healthcare means. And this really, for the most part, only applies to uh, patients who were diagnosed in childhood and may have been treated in a pediatric healthcare center or by a pediatrician and then is going on to an adult healthcare center or adult gastroenterologist. So the transition from pediatric to adult healthcare really is a gradual process. It's not the sudden transfer, that's an event that takes place usually around the age of anywhere from 16 to 19. But the transition really means the gradual assumption of more responsibilities and more independence by the adolescent as he or she gets older and the gradual, hopefully, release of some of those responsibilities from the parent and transferring over to the child. It also means that the, you know, the, the care that the child receives becomes less you know, maternalistic or paternalistic. The pediatricians have a very good habit of, of babying both parents and, and, uh, and patients and taking on a lot of that responsibility. So if you miss a, a clinic visit, often we'll call and see where you are and how you're feeling. That gradually goes away and really goes away once you go to an adult gastroenterologist where it's your responsibility to, to take on that role. So as you go from the more pediatric focused healthcare system to an adult healthcare system, what, what things do we expect you to, to be able to do as healthcare providers? Well, we expect you to know how to contact your doctor or nurse, know who the first point of contact is, when to call, and how to leave a message, and how to get a hold of somebody if you need help. Uh, we expect, oops, and I don't, there we go. We expect uh, that you should know your disease, so know where the location of your disease is, uh, what the name of your disease is, is it Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, or type unclassified, and know your medications. Know about dose, uh, know about what the name of your medication is, both the generic and the trade name, and also know about side effects of your medications where applicable, and what to look for if medications are not working properly for you. We expect you to know what the signs of a flare-up of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis are. So what do you usually feel when you get, when the disease is active and the inflammation is active? Uh, do you get diarrhea? Do you get stomach pain? Do you get other types of symptoms? And recognize when you're going through a flare and seek help. Uh, we expect you, really we expect teenagers for the most part around 16 or 17 years old to be able to conduct the clinic visits by themselves. Uh, patients should be comfortable speaking with their doctor. If you're not comfortable speaking to your doctor, is it because you know it's just not a good connection with the doctor and you're not able to, to communicate well with them? Or is it that you're not feeling comfortable enough with your own symptoms and your disease to be able to communicate what's going on to your doctor? I think both of them are a problem and you, you, need, you know nobody is going to help you but you in terms of identifying what the problem is and trying to get a fix for it. And then you should be able to know how to navigate health services in the healthcare system. And that doesn't just mean the hospital or the doctor's office. That means health insurance, which we'll deal with in a little bit. Uh, that means disability insurance and, and disability programs that are available either through work or through school and other aspects of healthcare services that you may need if things go badly. And it's really a matter of preparing yourself 
or if things go downhill. Everybody feels great when they're in remission, when the medicines are working, everything's fantastic, but some people do flare up and that those flare ups are completely unpredictable. You don't know when they're going to happen. It could be at the most inconvenient time possible. So you really need to be prepared for those flare ups, even if they never come and know what to do if they happen. So with all of this, you know, what, what you should be able to do as a young adult, uh, how do teens actually do, how do adolescents actually do when we're preparing them for transition? So that question we actually uh, tried to answer by doing a study at the Hospital for Sick Children when I was there. And essentially we used a, a transition tool called the IBD Passport which I'll talk about in a second, which is a, a wallet card basically that gives the characteristics of your disease. But we did use the website that creates the passport in order to test adolescents to see how much they knew about their disease uh, and to see uh, how much they knew compared to their parents. So we not only tested the, the kids, the adolescents, but we also tested the parents on the exact same questions. And essentially there were some aspects of healthcare that the teenagers did very well in and some aspects that they did not do so well in. So the things that they did well in were things like naming the characteristics of the disease. So what, what type of disease do you have? Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Where is your disease located? Both teens and their parents did pretty well with that. Around what date were you diagnosed? So most teenagers could tell us when they were diagnosed. Um, what were the names of your medications? We didn't actually ask them what the doses were. But I expect people will not know the exact dose necessarily, but should be able to name you know, how many pills they take and that sort of thing. Uh, but they were able to name the names of their medications, but also the names of natural therapies that they were on, vitamins and minerals that may be ta they may be taking, and also any allergies that they had to medications. What teenagers didn't do so well on were more health systems and health services related issues. So they weren't able to name the date of their last colonoscopy, even within three months. Their parents were, but they couldn't necessarily remember. And that's a big deal because if you go to an adult gastroenterologist who may not have all your records from pediatrics, you should at least be able to tell them when the last time you were fully investigated, when the last time, last time you had a scope or an MRI or an ultrasound or any other type of investigation. Uh, what was even more concerning was more the health systems aspects like insurance and pharmacy. So the parents did great on this. They all knew that what insurance company they used and they all knew what pharmacy they used, but the teens did not have a clue. So, you know, they really didn't know who their parents' insurance provider or how to contact that insurance provider if you needed medication. Uh, and in Ontario, it's really about medication insurance. We don't have public health care for medication unless you're on drug benefits, uh, government assistance. So everybody has insurance for their medication. And most teenagers didn't have a clue where to go for that. Uh, they also weren't able to name who their pharmacy was or where to pick up medications or uh, the location of the pharmacy at all. So those are all pretty concerning. If you move away and you don't know those things and you haven't prepared for it, uh, you may be stuck and not know what to do. So we had room to improve in terms of educating teenagers on their IBD. And so what we've done at CHEO is we've created a, a transition program and the center to our transition program is a, a checklist and an educational module that tries to get, starting at the age of 13 or 14 years old, tries to get uh, teens to understand their IBD, to understand what's expected of them and what they're going to need to know as they prepare to enter adulthood and leave home. And you can all access this, this educational program. It's available at our chio-ibd.ca website. And you can go directly to the transition program there at the CHEO website listed above. It's really just a PDF, but essentially it's split into uh, a number of educational modules aimed at different ages. And we sort of go through the requirements of you know, what, what's expected of you as a patient. And also for parents, there's an adult uh, module for what's expected of the parents and essentially when it's time to let go and what to expect your, your teenager to do as uh, he or she gets older. So you can actually go through the age specific if you're still a teenager and really the 17 year old module applies to anybody from 17 to kind of 21 or 22, especially if you weren't diagnosed in pediatrics, you can go through that 17 year old module to try to understand what adult gastroenterologists are expecting you to know as you go. And in the module, they sort of tell you the sort of that checklist that we all expect. You can see this is the one for the 17-year-old. Uh, that You should be able to tell others what subtype of IBD you have, how severe it was when you were diagnosed, and how it affects you on a daily life uh, point of view. How you should be able to go to clinic appointments by yourself without your parents. 
uh, and you know relay any questions that your parents might have, especially for a 17 year old whose parents are still involved and they still live at home. Uh, parents often have questions and we expect the, the teen to actually relay those questions and get the answers and then send them back to the parents. And then knowing the names of the medications and doses and other things. So there's, there's more in that checklist there, but uh, this is an example of one of the slides that you can see on the website. Um, it's important also that, that teens and young adults know what they need to know and what doctors need to know in terms of what if there's an emergency. And this is a really good site that actually creates the wallet card, this IBD passport I spoke about earlier. It creates a wallet card to, uh, to give to a healthcare provider in case of emergency. Obviously, when things are going wrong, you may not remember all the details of your disease. But if you go to this website, to kids.ca slash myhealthpassport, you select IBD from the drop-down menu, uh, you can actually create a passport, a wallet card that looks something like this. It's nothing fancy. There's no big graphics or anything like that. But it really contains all of the useful information that an, uh, an emergency provider or a walk-in clinic might need to know uh, about IBD. Uh, in particular, is, are you immunosuppressed? So if you come in and you're really unwell, uh, is this because you've got a bad infection and you're immunosuppressed? Who's your doctor? Who's your pharmacy? Things like that. All the in case of emergency things that, uh, that doctors may need to know. Now there are more high-tech versions of this out there now. There's certainly versions for uh, iOS and Android apps. Uh, you can also use the, the medical ID uh, function on iOS where you can put in a lot of the, your health information. Although that's not necessarily specific to IBD, it contains a lot of information that you may need to know uh, if you're a physician. And obviously Medical Alert will help, although some people just don't uh, feel comfortable wearing Medical Alert bracelets or necklaces. Those do help doctors if you're not responsive and, and we need help getting information on you. So how do teens and young adults feel about their transfer uh, from pediatric to adult care? So this is really about the transfer part, so the, the switching over from a pediatrician to an adult. This is an American study that interviewed uh, both the patients and the providers to get a gauge of how they feel things have gone in terms of their transfer. And I think it's an important study uh, because it's not, in, in the US, the transfer really can occur anywhere from 17 to 22 years old. So there's not that 18 year old cutoff. So it really does apply even to young adults uh, this, this information that they gathered really applies to young adults as well as teenagers. And so they, tr they interviewed the teenagers to, uh, to figure out how they felt about their transfer. And I think their responses are pretty enlightening. So you can see these, some of these quotes from patients, from young adult patients, related to the parental involvement during pediatric clinical visits. So the first quote is, I think it was helpful that my mom stopped coming with me to the doctor's offices. Uh, because when I was at the children's clinic, she'd answer all the questions for me, and I didn't really know what to say once I got to the adult clinic. Uh, the second quote is, when I was younger, it was, like, it was more my, like my mom's disease. It was mine, but I didn't really care. And the third quote, she, my mother, pretty much did everything. She paid and drove here, the children's clinic, asked questions that I couldn't think of. So we're now trying to avoid this sort of attitude. We're trying to avoid that when we transfer them to the adult clinic, they really, the teens or young adults, have no knowledge of their disease and don't know how to ask questions. And we're doing that by trying to see them on their own right from 14 years old and gradually uh, the parents kind of move more and more out of the picture. Uh, it's important to keep parents involved because they, you know, they have a, it's their concern and their child. But uh, we feel that the more responsibility the child has as they get older, the better off they're going to be as adult patients. And then this quotation at the bottom from the young adult patient related to parental withdrawal, they said, I would have appreciated maybe not my mother leaving, but just maybe like backing down a little bit and like letting me uh, answer my own questions a little bit more. So, you know, I think a lot of teenagers feel that way that, you know, they need to take, they want to take more responsibility about of, of regarding their disease and uh, it's important for them to do so. And these quotes are more from the clinicians, so for the, the adult gastroenterologists uh, who are involved after they're transferred from the pediatric uh, clinical care. So transition needs to start with the parent. Uh, we've discussed that already. There's a normal power st struggle between parent and teen. There are different priorities or agendas in transition. The parent has a priority, and then the patient or the teen has a priority, and they are different. I would say they're sometimes different. They're not always different, but it's important to recognize that they may be different. Parents, they just can't let go. They think, of their, that they think that their child can't do that. And the parents keep the child in the sick role. 
So as pediatricians, it's also our role to kind of treat the parent, to, to, to teach the parents that they can do this and young adults are able to do this on their own and they're going to have to do this on their own and it really just takes that trial, that separation a little bit to, to make it work. And so the quotes related recommendations from the adult gastroenterologist were uh, separate the child from the parent, ask the hard questions without the parents there or don't allow the parents to talk and make sure they understand the issues. And the second quote is, direct the conversation at the teen and not the parent, even if the parent is in the room. Put the decision-making power into the teen's hands. So important concepts that the adult clinicians really feel are important for us to know. And we hope that if that happens to you as a parent, if there's parents on the line, that you're not insulted, that we're trying to direct more towards the teenager to, to get independence is really part of this transition process. Uh, other quotes from the young adults related to their experience at adult clinical care facilities. So the, the young adult said, I kind of liked the transition because I felt like I was still being treated like a child, but with the transition to the adult clinic, I just liked it more because they were all honest and I just liked going to the adult clinic more. I've, got to, uh, I've gone to an adult doctor for the second time now. She just asked me questions. Here at the pediatric site, they are more thorough. There at the adult site, you have to tell them what you want. And that's an important, important message that it's not that the adult site is not thorough, but you really do need to be much more proactive in uh, telling them what you want and guiding your care. They're not going to chase after you and they're not going to baby you. They really want you to take responsibility for your disease and express your opinion. Um, and then other quotes include, if you have questions at the adult site, you didn't really get to ask them. I hope that's not true in most places. And I was, being, I was used to being uh, able to ask all the questions right there and then. And here at the pediatric site, you're kind of sheltered and everything is at your fingertips, but those resources aren't really there at the adult site. You have to go out of your way to get them. And you really do have to be the squeaky wheel, I think, at adult centers. They treat a lot more patients. It's, it's busier in a lot of cases. And so you really do have to speak up for yourself and tell them what you want. Uh, additional quotes from clinicians where proactive patients can make the transition smooth, but some patients wait until they're sick to make the transition, and that's hard. So we try as pediatricians to transfer patients when they're well and not when they're sick uh, so that it's a bit smoother. And again, this proactive message, really getting on top of things when you need to know something, you have to be the squeaky wheel. You have to really be proactive about it. Oh, and yeah, as I mentioned, that get patients to come when they're healthy. So uh, preparing for transfer. Um, so really, the messages that we, we gave in the last few slides are please take ownership of your illness. It really is up to you to make sure that you're going to be well and that your desires and wishes are known to the clinicians, to the, to the doctors, to the nurses, to the, other, the rest of the healthcare team. You need to speak up for yourself. Get to know your adult care team. It may be difficult uh, because it's so busy there, but you really want to know, get to know them before you leave home uh, so that you're comfortable calling when you need to. Get ready for health insurance. So a lot of the time, health insurance ends when you stop being a student, when you're covered under your parents. Uh, often the, the parental health insurance will continue coverage while you're in university or college, but as soon as you stop being a student, that ends. In addition, if your parents don't have health insurance, we'll talk a little bit about options, but th there are options through university or colleges as well, and obviously through work. And then please be proactive and ask questions about your disease, uh, get to know your disease, uh, and ask questions of your clinicians. So I'm going to hand it off to Emily for some personal stories about what you, what, uh, you went through, Emily, as a young adult who di being diagnosed. Yeah, so when I was diagnosed, I was 18 already. So I never actually got to experience pediatric care. Um, in the summer before I was diagnosed, when I was going to appointments and the doctors were trying to figure out what was wrong, my mom came to all of my appointments, which was great. I really appreciated having that support. Um, but then when I came to university, it was all of a sudden I had to start seeing a specialist by myself. And that was very daunting, especially because I'd never had any experience with seeing a specialist before. So, a few tips that I have, um, make sure that you know how to contact your doctor. I wasn't entirely sure how to contact my VI office at first, and this became an issue when I did get sick, and I wasn't entirely sure how to contact them. Um, another thing that I've found has really helped me is I make a list before I go to my appointments. Um, like Dr. Benjamin mentioned, 
at adult care centers, they are very busy. So your doctor has a lot of patients that they need to see. It's not that they don't have time to listen to all of your questions and concerns, but you just have to make sure that you have them ready to be addressed. So I usually just have a note on my phone that has some symptoms that I'm a bit concerned about, questions I have about medications. And this really helps to make sure that I benefit from my appointment as much as I can. It's also important, although you're taking a more independent step at managing your condition, to still involve your parents to some extent. I make sure that I call my mom before or after an appointment just to let her know what happens. Your parents will worry as you go away to school by yourself. It's just natural. And it's a good idea to kind of keep them informed on what's happening. So they still feel connected and just so that they don't worry too much about what's happening. Um, a bit on the topic of insurance, I'm lucky because my dad's insurance will cover me while I'm a student, but it's definitely important that you look into that and make sure you know when your insurance is going to end and what your options are as you move forward. And we'll definitely talk a little bit more about insurance in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. So Emily, I think you were going to deal with most of these. Yeah, so I can talk about how I, what I went through as I started at Queen's. So I was transferred immediately to a gastroenterologist in Kingston. So I had an appointment set up to go see them before I actually arrived at school, and that was good because I just had to figure out where I was going, and that was fine. Um, biologics, I started getting these um, at the end of my first semester. So it's just important that you have open communication with your doctor. So make sure that they provide you with information that you need to know and have a contact list of people that you need to contact if anything goes wrong or if you need to know something. Something that's very important is disability programs at schools. Make sure that you contact them as soon as you can. Um, I was diagnosed two weeks before I started at school, as I mentioned. So I did, one of the first things I did was I contacted as many different services at Queen's as I could. I'll speak about this a little bit later, but it's very important that you get these accommodations as soon as possible. Your professors will, of course, be very accommodating, but if you go up to them the day before the exam and say, oh, I would like some extra time, they aren't going to be as accommodating. So make sure, even if you're not in a flair, to re register with your school's accommodation services and know the services that are available for you, because it will definitely be helpful. And I'm going to talk a bit about healthy lifestyle, drugs, and alcohol a bit later, but Dr. Benjamin, if you want to touch on insurance and different steps that are important to take. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So uh, it's important to understand who's covering your insurance once you leave home, uh, especially in university or college. Are you continued to be covered under your parents' plan? Most universities do have a student, a group student insurance plan that you're automatically opted in on, and you have to go and opt out. So what I would recommend doing, and you get money back if you opt out, so you get part of your tuition back, not a huge amount, but a little bit. Uh, what I would recommend doing is really researching both insurance plans, if you're covered by your parents and your schools, find out what they cover and to what extent. So do they cover 80%, do they cover 100%, uh, what medications do they cover and is there a limit on what they cover. So this is really important, especially if you may be put on biologic therapy, which are extremely expensive and can range from $1,000 to $3,000 per month uh, in costs. So if you get stuck suddenly and you've opted out of the university plan and your parents' insurance only covers $5,000 a year, you may be stuck with a huge bill for the biologics. And you may not anticipate that you may need the biologics, but more and more people are getting biologic therapy. And by biologic therapy, I mean the antibody therapy, things like infliximab or adalimumab or vetalizumab. These are very expensive medications, and they're being used more and more often because they work really well for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So learn what, what is being covered by your parents' insurance uh, and what may be covered by the university. Sometimes you can keep both and they may supplement one another, although that can be a bit of an argument between insurance companies. You may have a fight on your hands as to which insurance company is going to cover more. But uh, sometimes having both is an advantage as well. And we'll talk if you don't have insurance or your parents don't have insurance or you don't qualify for insurance, we'll talk a bit about some options uh, in a few minutes. Um, in terms of other things that, that uh, Emily discussed, I think it's important to realize, at least for us as pediatricians, we usually transfer patients who are being transferred to adult care, we usually transfer them within the city. So we usually transfer people you know, from CHEO, we send them to a gastroenterologist in Ottawa. 
Now, you may be moving away, and you may not know at the time of transfer that you're moving away for university or college or for work. Uh, I'd say that most uh, young adults uh, continue with their gastroenterologist in their hometown and then make sure that they ask the adult gastroenterologist, you know, do you know of somebody in the town that I'm going to university in? Uh, and is there somebody available that you feel comfortable communicating with if something goes wrong? And that way you can get that person's uh, phone number and call them if something is going wrong and say, I'm not doing well and I don't have time to come home from my regular clinic visit, can you help me? And a lot of the time the adult gastroenterologist will be happy to send a letter to the, the other one in your university or college town and say, well, this is the information about this patient. He or she may come to you if things are not going well. So having a, uh, a plan if things don't go well is really important, and informing your doctor or nurse uh, about that plan is really important. Obviously, if you don't have an, a gastroenterologist, if it's a smaller city or town that you're going to university or college in or working in, there may not be a gastroenterologist in that city. And so you really need to be aware of that and know who to go to or where to go to access healthcare services because a lot of the time, especially with uh, complicated patients, walk-in clinic doctors, university doctors are not comfortable treating the, the Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Uh, and you may got, get stuck on steroids for the fifth time. You may get stuck on medications that you shouldn't be stuck on. So you really need to have a plan if things are not going well. The other point in terms of accessing biologics is that you may require an infusion center to get the biologics. So again, knowing where that infusion center is, wherever you're living, and how to access the infusion center uh, as well, or where to go to get access to the infusion center at the nearest large city or town is really important. So Emily, I'm not sure if you have anything else to add for this slide. I uh, know. I think the next slide is where I'm going to make some points. Perfect. Here we go. Okay, so I've listed here some different support systems that I've taken advantage of since starting at Queen's. So these are kind of the list of people that I contacted when I was diagnosed with Crohn's. Um, so I'd just like to talk about kind of how I've benefited from each of these um, services so that if you're interested, you can also look into them. I definitely recommend contacting an academic coordinator. I did this and within a few days I was able to rearrange my first semester schedule to make it a little bit lighter just so it would be easier to adapt to living at university and coping with my condition. And the academic coordinator was also able to put me in contact with props throughout the year if I had to miss a class for an appointment or I needed an extension on an assignment. It was an enormously beneficial resource. And she also put me in contact with some different services that I hadn't actually heard of. One was disability accommodations. I didn't think to contact them until she recommended that I did. Um, but disability accommodations was really, really beneficial. I was able to get extra time to write my examinations. And I was able to write them in a separate environment than other students. So I wasn't in the gymnasium or the lecture hall that everyone else wrote in. And this helped because obviously stress often makes symptoms worse, and knowing that I was in a smaller room with ready access to a bathroom and extra time in case I had to leave and come back was really, really useful at doing well during first year. I would also recommend if you're preparing to move away to university, contacting campus housing. I had already been assigned my residence room before, or yeah, before I was diagnosed, so I ended up staying in the residence I was in, but the university did ask me if I wanted to be transferred to a room with a private bathroom. Obviously, the accommodations will depend on the housing that your school has, but you can look into getting a private washroom or facilities like that. Food services is another really important one. Um, navigating the dining hall is kind of a challenge for any first year student, but even more so when you have a chronic condition that imposes many dietary restrictions on you. Um, I met with the head chef of the CAF at Queen's and they showed me around, they showed me where food was and where I could find dairy-free alternatives, people I could talk to if I had questions, and they actually gave me a number that I could call before I went to the dining hall and I could request whatever food I wanted. So if I wanted just plain chicken breast and some steamed vegetables, I was able to do that. And that was really beneficial when I was in a flare and I couldn't eat a lot of the food that they were serving. Another service that's important that I didn't contact right away was counseling. This is obviously a personal choice, but balancing a chronic condition and moving away to university is very stressful. So if you do feel like you need to talk to someone and you don't 
want to talk to your friends or you feel that they wouldn't really understand, I'd recommend seeking out counseling services at your school. They're usually free and it's people who are there to help you get through what you're experiencing. I went to counseling once during first year and then again during second year and even into third year and it's just so beneficial to have someone that you can talk to and kind of work through what you're experiencing because as much as it is a physical condition, your mental mindset is equally important. Um, student groups is another thing to look into. I was really lucky to discover the Queen's Crimson and Coitus Committee within my first week coming to Queen's. Um, I joined this group and it was amazing. It was really gratifying to have the opportunity to reach out to other students who are going through an experience similar to my own, to raise awareness for IBD, and just to help out in that way. Um, and joining extracurriculars is a great way to meet people and to just kind of unwind and, yeah, I just really recommend it. There's so many at school. Also, talking to your friends is maybe one of the hardest things to do, but it can also be really beneficial. When I started at Queen's, my initial thought was I'm not going to tell anyone about this. I'm going to keep it a secret. I don't want people to know. But when you're taking upwards of a dozen pills a day and living in such close living quarters with people, they start to notice that there's something going on. And I was actually really surprised at the great response that I had from people when I shared my condition with them. Two of my closest friends from first year actually had siblings who had IBD, so they knew exactly what I was going through. And everyone was really understanding if I couldn't come to an event because I had a doctor's appointment or just because I wasn't feeling well, it was really nice to have that support from friends. And it does get easier to tell people about your condition. The first time I told someone it was terrifying, but now it's pretty easy to do, and I definitely recommend trying to as much as you can. Great. Thanks, Emily. Uh, a little bit more about health insurance. We covered most of these things, but just so that everybody is aware of the different types of insurance that are out there. So you've got some areas where you have public coverage, so the government supplements you and pays you back for health care. Uh, examples include Manitoba and Quebec to a certain extent where you may not necessarily need health insurance uh, and the government covers it. There's your parents' insurance. There's also the university group plan, as I mentioned before. In Ontario, we have things like Ontario Drug Benefits and the Trillium Drug Plan, where you apply to the government for these benefits. And depending on your income and the need, uh, they assess your bank accounts for Trillium. They assess other things and see how much you need in order to be reimbursed. And these plans are really, really useful in when you need biologics and you've got expensive medications that you need to get covered and you just can't afford them otherwise. Uh, be aware that if you are applying for private insurance with a pre-existing condition, insurance companies may just say no to you or you may be charged an extremely expensive fee. So if you are getting those responses from private insurance companies, do look into the more public plans and see if you can get a better deal uh, from that. Uh, and then finally, be aware of the biologics and the infusion centers where you can get patient care support. So many of the biologic providers uh, and the infusion center coordinators are able to provide you with support and give you resources to know where to go. So if you know your uh, biologic infusion or uh, administration coordinator, uh, it's a, they are a very useful uh, resource and often they're nurses that can help you out as well. Uh, in terms of lifestyle, um, I think it's important to stress that tobacco, nicotine, uh, and probably e-cigs as well are a no-no. So I'm hoping that all of your physicians and nurses have spoken to you about how bad uh, smoking is for Crohn's disease, how it's associated with an increased risk of flare-up, an increased risk of hospitalization, and an increased risk of needing surgery for stricturing disease and obstructions. So we don't really understand why, but please, please stay away from tobacco and nicotine. And for the time being, I would say e-cigarettes as well are probably not a good idea until we learn more about them. Alcohol, be aware that alcohol is contraindicated with some medications. Medications like methotrexate causes some scarring of the liver. And so if you're drinking uh, heavily in terms of alcohol, um, you are at risk for worse liver problems and even hepatitis or liver failure. In particular, you know, I usually tell patients that you know, one beer here and there is not going to make a big deal to your liver. The big danger really is binge drinking, so having multiple beers and getting drunk. Uh, in one session is really quite a big deal, especially with some of these medications, and it can be dangerous to your liver and to your body as a whole. 
And Emily, I'll, I'll let you speak a little bit about alcohol and how it affects your Crohn's disease. Yeah, so alcohol is definitely something that's challenging because when you move away to school, not everyone drinks, but lots of people do, and you can definitely feel that social pressure to join in. Um, I did try to keep up with my peers for a while. This lasted for maybe three weeks, and then I had a flare-up that lasted for the rest of the semester. So you really have to keep in mind that this will have an impact on your body, and there are risk, risks involved. So really listen to your body, know what your tolerance is, and obviously the best thing is to stay away from alcohol, but if you do choose to drink, then you have to know that there will be consequences. And you have to find out what works for you, but just really listen to your body and make smart decisions. Great. One of the top questions we get in clinic is about marijuana. So Health Canada has approved medical marijuana, has approved Crohn's disease as an indication for medical marijuana. Uh, and so a lot of patients are wondering how will marijuana affect the Crohn's disease. And the reality is that we really don't know, and there's not a lot of evidence for marijuana in treating Crohn's disease. We know that marijuana can help with chronic pain, and we're hoping that you're not in chronic pain if your Crohn's has been treated well, although that's not always uh, the, same, the case. But uh, most people are aware of a very, uh, fairly large randomized controlled trial that looked at medical marijuana and how it affects Crohn's disease and showed a benefit. Uh, there's problems with that trial, and not the least of which is that they, to show a benefit, they used a symptom score, which really gauges how a patient is feeling and is the patient feeling better. So not surprisingly, marijuana makes patients feel better but we don't know how it affects their Crohn's or ulcerative colitis inflammation underlying that. And in fact, there was a study from the University of Calgary which showed that people who smoke marijuana have worse disease and more severe disease. So right now, the, the, the jury's kind of out on marijuana for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And knowing that smoking marijuana, there's a lot of toxins, there may be that same effect as tobacco, smoking tobacco, we just don't know right now. So if patients come to me asking for medical marijuana, I frequently say I'm not comfortable with that and there's not enough evidence to prescribe it and I know a lot of adult gastroenterologists feel similarly uh, although you may get another opinion from other people and junk food I think you know the, the message here is that keep your body healthy and your IBD will stay well and stay in remission and so really junk food uh, for us you know we recommend keeping a healthy diet and keeping active and that's the best thing for your disease Emily I'll let you chat about that as well yeah, so definitely eating healthy is a great way to control your condition. Um, I've found that, like when I'm stressed, I tend to stress eat, but this makes me feel worse, and it's just this vicious cycle. So I really had to watch what I'm eating. Um, I personally don't eat gluten or dairy, but I would definitely suggest talking to your doctor, figuring out a diet plan that works for you, and trying to stick to it as much as you can. This is very hard in first year when you're navigating the cafeteria, but since then, I've been able to prepare my own food, which is actually a lot easier. I can cook myself healthy stuff. I know exactly what is in it. And you just feel so much better when you're eating healthy. So it might take a bit of an extra effort, but it's definitely worth it. And this leads us to stress management. Yeah, so I can talk a bit about this. Um, you really have to figure out what works best for you. I'll highlight some techniques and strategies that I've used. So balanced lifestyle is important. You shouldn't spend all of your time studying, nor should you spend all of your time going out with friends. Um, I would recommend trying to maintain a balance between the two, really listening to your body. If you're tired, stay in, don't go out that night, and stay on top of your condition that way. Time management is very important. The busier you are, the better your time management gets. Um, exercise is a great way to de-stress and to also manage your condition. Um, it can be a way to be social if you want to join intramural sports. I really like yoga because it helps me to kind of calm down and unwind when I'm really stressed out about school. Um, if you like drawing or you play an instrument, that's a great creative outlet. One thing I really want to emphasize is campus clubs. There's so many ways to get involved in university, and I've had really, really great experiences with campus clubs. In first year when I was sick, the one time when I would kind of forget about my condition and feel normal was when I was volunteering to teach young girls about engineering and science or working with the Crohn's and Colitis Committee. So it's a really great way to de-stress and just forget about all of the academics and stuff. But again, make sure you don't get too busy. This is another trap that I fall into. I'll sign up for a whole bunch of stuff and then stop taking care of myself. So the next point is really important. It's an ongoing process. You have to listen to your body, 
find what works for you and stick with it. Even when you're healthy, if you start to try to go out too much or you stop eating healthy, you may find that your symptoms do come back. That's how it works for me. And so it's very important to manage your stress and take care of yourself even when you are in remission. In terms of recognizing a flare, I think most of you probably have already dealt with a flare in terms of how you were diagnosed, but there's any number of symptoms uh, that can present as a flare. What's important to remember is that all of these symptoms can affect school and work performance. So be aware that when you're in a flare, you probably are not at your top peak performance. And if you've got exams coming up, if you've got a big job uh, interview, or if you've got other factors, uh, you may not do that well at that time. And so you really need to be prepared and recognize it earlier, early in order to get on top of it. And that's our message in terms of during a flare, it's really be aware that it's happening and get help early. Uh, from a health services point of view, in terms of physicians, really we want to minimize the use of walk-in clinics and the emergency room. They, they don't provide you with the best quality of care when it comes to your IBD. You may get a lot of CT scans, you may get stuck on steroids, but in the long term it's not the solution for your IBD. Uh, minimize the use of narcotics, marijuana, and other drugs, especially during a flare. Narcotics can cause really bad outcomes for IBD uh, during a flare and keep your school professors and employers informed if you can, if you feel comfortable with that, uh, especially your disability program if you're in school, and let them know that things are not going well and that you might need accommodation. The more they're able to prepare for this, the more likely you are to, for them to say yes. Listen to your body. It's going to tell you what you can and can't do and get the help that you need early. Uh, get on top of it early so that you don't have any, uh, any problems going forward. And I'll just add two points here. So in terms of getting your school and professors and employers informed, having those systems and services, like the resources you need in place already, is really important. Disability Services gave me a letter that I could give to my professors. It didn't say what my condition was or anything, but it just said that I may have health concerns and that may affect my performance. So I was able to give that to my professors. It was I could send it by email, so it was a really low stress way to deal with things. Also, it's very important to know how to contact your doctor if you're in a situation where you're experiencing a flare. I didn't know how to contact my GI, and I kind of let my flare get worse and worse before I contacted anyone, and I ended up on steroids, and it was just not a great experience. So make sure that you know how to contact people and contact them as soon as you think something might be happening. Great. And we're conscious of the time, but we also wanted to provide you with some resources, some reading that you can do on the web, uh, and some help that you can get. Uh, this website, ibdu.org, is, is aimed at young adults uh, transitioning to university or college by the PHGI Society, NASPGAN. Um, this next site, just like me, at IBD, is by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America and NASPGAN, again, aimed at young adults and uh, teenagers on the transition and what they expect when they go to school. And then finally, this is a great program by Crohn's and Gladys Canada, uh, gutsypeersupport.ca, really aims to get you online support, hook you up with a peer uh, who can guide you and help you when you need help. And that's really important in a place when, you, when you're away from home and you don't know anybody and you may not know anybody in that area with Crohn's and colitis. I think this online support group is a great idea and you can sign up for it at this website. So those are all the, the slides that we've got, uh, and we have time for some questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Benchmull and Emily. This was a fantastic presentation, and I know um, from an advocacy perspective, I learned a lot about um, insurance and about approaching your disability office as soon as possible. Uh, so thank you both for a very informative and valuable presentation. Now, um, before we get to the question and answer period, I wanted to remind everyone about our next webinar. Our next youth webinar is on Tuesday, October 6th, so mark that into your calendars. Um, it will be on the topic of tests, tests, and more tests, surviving school and the doctor's office. Our expert speakers will explore the different medical tests that patients with Crohn's and colitis may experience and ways to balance these with school. Now, since I'm also on the line, I wanted to put in a little plug for a webinar that I will be running next Tuesday. Um, it's an advocacy-based webinar. Um, it touches on some of the tips that uh, Dr. Benchimal and Emily talked about, um, how to be a more effective advocate 
Um, and this webinar will introduce you to key advocacy concerns for people affected by Crohn's and colitis. Um, it will recommend ways you can effectively reach out to your elected official or your local candidates during the election period. That webinar will take place next Tuesday, September 29th at 7 p.m. So if you'd like to um, sign up for one or both of these webinars, you can visit Crohn's and Colitis ca slash webinar for more details um, and to register for these sessions. If you can't make it to the webinar, don't worry, you can still register anyhow and a recording of these sessions will be sent to you later. So now to move forward to our question and answer, um, we will open up the floor to any questions you may have for our speakers, so feel free to type in your questions to the question box. If we do run out of time, you can still send your questions to info at ibdscholarship.ca and we will do our best to, to provide you with answers to your questions. So our, our first question is for Emily. Emily, um, one of our uh, participants have, have asked, I, I know you touched a bit on this issue, but if you could explain further about how you, uh, how did you find a GI before you left for school? And if you could talk about how easy was it to set up an appointment with them? Um, so I was actually pretty lucky in this respect. I saw a GI from my hometown in Alliston, and he was the one who made the diagnosis. But this was August 16th, and I was moving to school on September 1st. So he immediately referred me to a GI in Kingston. He contacted them. And I guess his office set up an appointment for me to go see them. So I was really fortunate to have that in place as I was going away to school. So I would definitely talk to the GI that you're seeing now and ask them if they're able to set something up for you in whichever town you're going to school at. That's great. And Dr. Benchimal, this next question is for you. Um, do you have any tips for making it easier or ways to encourage teens to take a more active role in understanding their disease? So I think it's really about being proactive. So if your doctor is not seeing you on your own, ask if you could see your doctor on your own for the beginning of the visit without your parents in the room. Uh, I think the doctors will uh, certainly understand the need for that. Um, and you know, ask for more information. So often the pediatric centers have nurses and nurse educators that are involved in people's care, and they can provide you with education about where your disease is, what uh, what sort of uh, characteristics, what medications you're on, things like that. There's also a great book out there, and I am looking it up as we speak. I believe it's called Your Child with Inflammatory Bowel Disease. It's uh, not. It, it's aimed at families. Yeah, it's called Your Child with, Fem with Inflammatory Bowel Disease, uh, and it's by uh, NASPGAN, the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology. You can look up the name Busvaros, B-O-U-S-V-A-R-O-S. So it's aimed at families, and it's sort of for caregivers, but it's also certainly at the level that a teenager or young adult can read, and it provides excellent, excellent information on IBD, all the different treatments, symptoms, nutrition, diet therapies, everything like that. I think it's a great start in terms of places to read. Uh, we also recommend certain websites. Crohn's and Colitis Canada is one of them, uh, the CHEO IBD Center as well, uh, CCFA, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, all have great websites on learning about IBD. Uh, but being proactive by far is the most important thing. Um, we also just received a question online. Um, one participant is wondering, you've mentioned that tobacco is, is not exactly good for Crohn's, but this individual has heard that it's good for colitis. Now, is that true? So we're not really clear on that. Certainly there were some studies, uh, population studies, that have shown that smoking uh, reduces the severity of ulcerative colitis. I think uh, some of the newer studies are not showing that. There's not as much of an effect on the severity of colitis. And re remember that now we have access to better tests about severity. We do scopes more often. They're easier to get. We have calprotectin. We have MRIs. So we're better able to measure severity than we were even 10 years ago. So I think we have a better handle on that, and it may not actually benefit ulcerative colitis severity. It probably doesn't worsen it, but I think the risks of smoking cigarettes far outweigh any benefits you would get from ulcerative colitis. The risk of lung cancer and many other types of cancers, 
the risk of emphysema and lung diseases, uh, I think it's really not worth the, the small benefit that there might be in terms of severity of ulcerative colitis. You're better off using medications and diet uh, and lifestyle changes to manage your ulcerative colitis than using tobacco. Thank you so much for answering some of these questions. Again, if you have any more questions, um, because we're running out of time, uh, we recommend that you contact us by email at info at ibdscholarship.ca. So now, as we're drawing near to the end, I'd like to take this opportunity to let everyone know that we will be following up with you after the webinar via email to get your feedback and any suggestions you may have for future topics. We will also send you a link to a recording of today's presentation. And this concludes today's webinar. I want to thank everyone for being with us today and for the great questions. I especially want to thank our speakers, Dr. Eric Benjamal and Emily Heffernan, for taking time out of their busy schedules to share their expertise and their experience with us all. Also, thank you to AbbVie for supporting this webinar. Thank you. Good night.